Good morning, Dr. Gabra. Good morning. You can hear me, obviously. Can you see me? Yes, yes and I can see you. Yes. Good. Um, in a moment or two, I'm going to ask Mary to ask you to take the oath. Uh, let me tell you um, who you're talking to. You, you have a, a small and select group of people here in Aldwych in London. There are uh, probably a large number, around 100 or so, uh, who will be watching remotely online. Today, uh, we are also uh, challenged, as we have been earlier this, uh, this month, this session, um, by the fact that Ms. Scott, who will be asking the questions, it will be asking those from a remote link herself. Uh, and that's caused a slight delay in starting this morning. I'm sorry uh, about the technical hitch. You are uh, at home, are you? Sorry, I didn't get... Uh, are you in Birmingham? Uh, are you at, at, uh, at home? Yes, yes I'm in Birmingham. Yes. Uh, and uh, are you on your own? Uh, you mean in the room? Yes. Oh, no, I am. Yes, I am. I am on my own. Yes, my, Thank you. My wife... My wife is still at home, but she's somewhere else, I think. <laughs> right. Um, when we get to a break, we'll have our first break around about quarter past 11, um, a chance for you to um, take a break. That, in, during that and any following break, you must not talk to anyone, including your wife, uh, about the evidence you have given or evidence which you think you may yet be asked to give, but you can talk about anything else. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, I, I'll ask uh, Mary then to ask you to take the, uh, the oath. Please state your full name. Gamal Saber. Gabra. Take the book in your raised hand and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Miss Scott. Miss Scott? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, Dr. Gabra, can you hear me and see me? Yes, yes. Thank you. I'm going to start, Dr. Gabber, by um, going through with you uh, details of your career. Um, so is it right that in 1970, between 1970 and 1972, you were a senior house officer in clinical pathology and haematology at the, at the Isle of Thanet group of hospitals and at the haemophilia centre there? That's correct, yes. Uh, and uh, during your time there, were you involved in clinical care of people with haemophilia? Yes. And did you um, administer cryoprecipitate during your time there? Yes, yes, and, and produce it as well. And did you have any experience of factor concentrates? Um, I knew that they were available in, in a shelf stored for emergency, and they used to come from... Oxford. Um, that's all right. So the main was the was the main treatment at that time cryoprecipitate. Correct. Yes. yes. Uh, and then in 1972, between 1972 and 1974, you were a registrar in clinical pathology and haematology at the laboratory services based at Stirling and Falkirk Royal Infirmaries in Scotland. Is Correct. that right? Correct. Yes. What, um, what, 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 what did you actually do uh, in your registrar post during that period? Uh, 
I used to I used to see patients. Uh, I used to uh, sort out the results of the tests that come, and I used to I think I I I, I think I used to share in the clinic that the hematologist used to have. At, and can I, I can't remember the details exactly. And in terms of the, the treatment of patients, um, was, was, were you providing mainly cryoprecipitate at that, at that stage? No, I wasn't, I wasn't giving, giving uh, patients. It's, uh, it, was, it was just a clinic to see patients. But they, they were not specifically uh, hemophilia patients, hematology patients. Ah, hematology. And, and were you... Were Anemia is and were you seeing um, people with haemophilia at that stage? Sorry? Were you, see were you seeing people with haemophilia at that stage? I, I was not. I was not seeing specifically people with haemophilia. I stopped my, my actual clinical use of my skills in haemophilia after leaving uh, uh, the south of Scotland, the south of England. And then in 1974, you took up a post as, as registrar um, and then uh, subsequently becoming senior registrar in haematology and blood transfusion at the Glasgow and West of Scotland Blood Transfusion Centre. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Um, and you stayed um, at the, blood transfu the, the Glasgow and West of Scotland Blood Transfusion Centre until 1989 becoming a consultant in 1980. Yes, that's correct. Um, and while you were um, in, in, uh, at the Glasgow Centre, you, your CV tells us that you had secondments to the Glasgow Teaching Hospital. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, it was a necessary part of um, my preparation for the... Uh, 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 the uh, Sorry, I, I run short of words, so please put up with me. Um, the, the College of Pathology. The, and, uh, and, and, and I, I, I needed six months at least of a hospital clinical training. So I did that in, in the Royal Infirmary. And so that was presumably in the, <clears throat> the early years of your, uh, as your time as a, as a registrar? Yes, yes. And then your CV tells us that once you became a consultant, is this right, you became honorary clinical lecturer <clears throat> at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Glasgow and also honorary consultant haematologist to the Greater Glasgow Health Board. Yes, yes, yes. Again, can you tell us a little bit about what you were doing as honorary clinical le lecturer um, at the University of Glasgow. I'm, I'm trying to remember if I had part in the in the teaching of uh, students. In but that I don't think that this happened in in, in Glasgow. Uh, it happened. It happened uh, actually in, when I came down to Birmingham. So it was an honorary. Uh, sort of position. Truly honorary in that, in that you weren't really doing any teaching? No, no, I don't think I was doing it in, in I can't remember I did that in, in class. And can you recall what you were doing in your role as honorary consultant haematologist for the Greater Glasgow Health Board? Yes, I think I remember I used to join the clinic for um, the follow-up of women with uh, um, anti-D in their pregnancy. And there was a clinic and I used to attend it uh, representing the transfusion service so that we can follow it up, follow the patients up the levels of antibody supply of uh, uh, products for 
for uh, intra-implant transfusion and that sort of thing. So it was a regular, I think it was a weekly meeting at the hospital itself where I, where I used to work. And then in 1989, you took up a post in Geneva as the blood program advisor uh, to the League of the Red Cross and the Red Crescent Societies. Um, and that post also involved being part of the Secretariat of the World Health Organization Global Blood Safety Initiative. That's correct, yes. Uh, and we'll look at a, 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 um, a document that you were involved in um, during that time a little bit later on today. And then in 1992, you returned to the UK, taking up a post at the Birmingham Regional Transfusion Centre in the West Midlands, first of all as consultant, and then as deputy director, and then when uh, the National Blood Authority took over the Regional Transfusion Centre as lead medical consultant. Yes, yes. It was quite a change happening in a short time, yes. Yeah, and we'll come back to that um, in the course of your evidence. Yeah. And then you retired in March 2003. Correct, yes. Um, right, I'm going to ask you some questions now about your time in Glasgow um, uh, when you uh, uh, arrived there in 1974 as a registrar. Uh, was the centre director Dr John Wallace? Yes, yes. And he had been in place, had he, since 1946? I, I, yes, I, I wasn't sure, but I think he was the, the head when it started to be there. Yes. And certainly he'd been in place for a long time when, by the time you arrived. Yes, I think it's during the war, or after, just after the war. Um, and he was replaced not, not long after you arrived, in 1976, by Dr Ruthven Mitchell. Is that right? That's correct, yes. Uh, and he remained centre director for the time that you were, uh, for the whole time you were in Glasgow, uh, until you left in 1989. Yes, I, yes, I, I'm aware that he was there. Now, between 1974 and 1980, when you were registrar and senior registrar, can you recall what your duties were and what your responsibilities were um, at the Glasgow Centre? Yes, um, I think I, I mentioned something about it uh, when you asked me an earlier question. Um, John Wallace was very keen to, uh, to establish contact and relationships with the hospitals in the region, in the West, West, Mid West Midlands. Um, not West Midlands, West Midlands is, is for, for, uh, for uh, down south, but for uh, the West Transfusion Service area hospitals. And uh, he was keen to, um, and where this is where I used to join him, and to um, in, in in the meetings in hospitals, in order to persuade people to uh, not to abuse uh, the use of blood, and to, to have guidelines for the, for the clinical uh, use of blood, and also to uh, uh, to to to, f to facilitate their acceptance of using. Uh, red cell concentrates rather than in order to store the plasma. And yeah. that was quite an interesting point where I, he was also involved in the, in the clinic for uh, the women with, uh, again, pregnant women with NTD problems. Uh, and uh, I used to attend the uh, these clinics, either with him or on, uh, on his behalf. Just picking up then on the work that you were doing with Dr. Wallace, trying to persuade clinicians not to use whole blood, but to use concentrated red cells. Which is better than me. I'm so sorry about expressing myself. Thank you. Um, 
how um, and you've explained that you did that by meeting with them in person so was it was it was, it, was there a program of going around all of the hospitals to meet with the clinicians yes 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 that's what he was doing and how um successful were those attempts and how how were how were they how did how did the clinicians respond to these hematologists coming along and telling them how they should practice yes i i, I think i think i i personally noticed at when we were looking at the usage that it was increasing very slowly i think it was around 30% or 40% when we started and it then I remember a figure of 60% uh, that has gone and sparing the, the use of unnecessary, the unnecessary use of, uh, of uh, whole blood. So I have, re I have, no, I have, I realized, I felt myself that this was incredibly, it was successful, but, uh, but up to a point. And then after that, it's difficult to, to support, uh, to... And, um... So, is it right to understand as well, or did the, the 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 discussion with colleagues in those early years, concentrating on 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 the use of red cell concentrates, was it also part of the discussion then, or at a later point, um, to try and encourage them to use less blood and blood products? Full stop. Yes. Yes. And again, how was how was that received by the by your clinical colleagues? Were were they receptive to your to your message? Well, in, in one way, yes, and in other ways, they would say, "Well, just don't talk to me about this. Just give me the red stuff." So, so there was a degree of reluctance in accepting that concept. Uh, and you mentioned in your um, answer to my first question, I think, the idea of coming up with guidelines for use of, of blood and blood products. We've heard from other witnesses that they introduced schedules. Uh, so, for example, for hip operations, they might have a schedule which would say, you know, that the average amount of units of blood in a hip, in a hip replacement is whatever it is, six. And that would become the the norm for ordering for a hip, uh, a hip replacement. Was anything of that nature introduced in, in Glasgow? I, I, I must, since I'm saying the truth only, I cannot remember uh, the details that you mentioned, but it, it, it is likely that this has happened because there was a movement um, in, in, in many hospitals, particularly the, the, the large hospitals, the, the university hospital, in Glasgow, uh, to accept this fact and to and to and the communication was was closer than uh, when the time came for uh, John Wallace. But John Wallace used to talk simply and in a simpler way. There wasn't anything, so uh, probably that is that has come later. But I cannot exactly say, you know, that this has been written and uh, and I have seen. I can't remember that. And is it right to understand from your answers that your evidence that you were keeping an eye on the use of red cell concentrates and so on in, in Scotland, when I say you, I mean at, at the Glasgow Centre, that there was a process of auditing the use of blood and blood products in the area? In, yes, in, in one way, yes. When I mentioned the figures, it was based on vision from the past about the, the progress <clears throat> in the in reducing the use of uh, whole blood uh, and uh, and store and getting plasma for for, for products <clears throat> were did you attend donor sessions um in in those early years before you became a consultant Yes, yes, and I was I was <clears throat> actually involved in, in also in recruiting and maintaining uh, donors who had antibodies uh, for the NTD for the NTD preparation, and uh, I can't I'm, I'm mixing things up now. I think we were sending this uh, antibody-rich plasma for fractionation in Glasgow, not in Glasgow, in Edinburgh, 
and um, there was there was quite a number of these donors that were boosted by uh, rhesus positive cells in order to increase the level of uh, of antibody and I seem to remember that, but it, the, the, but I remember vividly that this has happened um, because it's, it was uh, when I was in Birmingham. But we used to store these red cells in from specific donors uh, in uh, in, uh, in liquid nitrogen and use the same cells for each donors and have. The, and have plasma phoresis for them. So uh, that was another another one of my activities in, in Glasgow. And then once you became a consultant in 1980, your statement tells us that you were involved in donor care, sorry, donor care and plasma collection and shared medical responsibility for the serology testing laboratory of patients and blood donations. Correct. Is that right? Yes, that's the that's the, the large main involvement. I'm just going to ask you some questions now about the actual centre itself. And um, is it right to understand that the headquarters of the Glasgow and uh, West of Scotland Centre was based in uh, in the Law Hospital in Lanarkshire? Correct. Yes. And I may add that this was initially a hospital and. A, an army hospital for for patients who were um, coming with uh, with wounds during first the second world war so it was out of glasgow away from the bombs uh, and that is that where the laboratory service for the transfusion center was that's correct yes yes and is it also right to understand that there was a freeze drying plant at the law hospital yes and it was mainly introduced, I think, during the war to supply plasma. Uh, and that was that formed part of the of the transfusion centre, did it? That's correct. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, and there was also a blood donor centre in Vincent Street in Glasgow. Yes. Where you would hold donor sessions. Yes, but uh, I I I used to go there if they need they needed someone if one of the medics was not there, but it wasn't my main. My main, that's my main activity. And, and, and the donor records were kept there, is that right? The, the donor records were kept in the Vincent Street, on the Vincent Street site. I, I, I think that it is possible, but I, I can't remember exactly whether it was kept in the headquarters, in the hospital, in, the, in, 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 uh, in Lanark, in Lanarkshire or in, in the in the in the centre, I can't remember exactly. Now we've heard from other uh, uh, witnesses from Scottish centres that they carried out blood banking for the hospitals in which they were based. Was that the case in in, in for Glasgow? Were you the blood bank for the Law Hospital? Um, no, no, they had their own blood bank actually had their own blood bank. And uh, they, I can't remember the number of hospitals, but it was quite a, an area. And uh, we used to supply blood routinely uh, every, every day, regarding to, according to what they have requested. So the, the Glasgow Centre, unlike the other centres we've heard about, was run more along the English lines. It was a transfusion centre separate from the hospitals it served. Yes, yes. Um, I'm just going to take you to a document um, to um, uh, and ask you some questions about the facilities. Um, and it's SBTS uh, 40047006. I think you have to say underscore 006. Sorry, underscore zero zero six. Pick your pardon. So SBTS four zeros four zero seven underscore zero zero six. Hmm. 
So here we've got a visit to the Glasgow and West of Scotland Blood Transfusion Centre in March 1982. And we can see uh, the, who the, ins the inspectors are listed there and the personnel seen. And that doesn't include you. Presumably that, that well, uh, uh, we can see that that doesn't include you. Um, and then if we go down the page to paragraph, we, paragraph two, we can see a previous inspection was carried out on the 17th of January, 1980. And at paragraph three, um, it, said, it, it, it has to be said that the preparation area for bottles and closures, which was criticized on the previous informal visit was substantially worse at the time of this inspection. This seems to be due to circumstances beyond the control of the transfusion center staff and has been caused by the uncertain future of the freeze dry facility. And then it talks about the purchase of a new autoclave having gone ahead. And then if we look at paragraph four and five, we can see the ambit of the visit restricted to the manufacturing activities conducted at the centre, along with the quality control activities. No donor services were visited and activities at the Glasgow Street, Vincent, the Glasgow Street, Vincent Street, donor centre were also not seen um, and serious attention was not given to the serology laboratory practices and their reagent preparation. So just pausing there, that Dr. Gabra might be a reason why they didn't see you because this isn't your, wasn't your key area of responsibility in 1982, is that right? Yes, yes, yes. But I, uh, I, I became aware that and I knew that this was happening and uh, it was restricted for some reason. I don't know why. I can't remember why in the discussion. But certainly if, it wasn't up to standards. Yes. Uh, it, it, and, and so if we then go over the page to paragraph nine. We can see there it says the, the region is largely self-sufficient in terms of procurement of source material. Um, in addition, they do not supply processed materials to sources outside the region other than freeze-dried plasma. And I'll come on to ask you some questions about freeze-dried plasma in, in due course. So um, in 1982, that, that seems to be the position largely self-sufficient in terms of procurement of source material. Um, and then if we go on to paragraphs 11 and 12, um, we can see... Um, uh, the, some, some of the difficulties that the inspectors see, um, particularly in paragraph 12, um, it's understood that this is the only way in which 22 tonnes of plasma per year can be processed um, and in process monitoring results appear to show no contamination problem of any significance. Um, and then if we go down to par paragraph 14, and just get a flavour of some of the difficulties that the uh, centre seem to be having. Area is overcrowded, contains packaging materials as well as finished product. Um, and then we can see, uh, it's probably best picked up, I think, at page 11, uh, where the summary uh, section starts. Summary of comments made. And we can see under A, um, comments on practices. And then if we not spend any time on that, it sets out some of the um, issues there. And then if we turn over um, to page 12, we can see um, B, uh, B there, facilities, paragraph 118, uh, some of the challenges uh, that the Glasgow Centre had there. We can see storage is totally inadequate. Um, uh, 119, they are inadequate because existing stores are either overcrowded or of an unsatisfactory nature. <clears throat> it talks about dripping pipe work and dusty conditions. Uh, uh, 122, preparation area for containers is appalling. This work needs to be finished without uh, delay. 123, aseptic areas are not to an adequate standard and then sets out the reasons why that is. Uh, one, two, four, freeze drying is conducted under very poor conditions. Um, and then uh, one, two, five, 
the high risk hepatitis facility is not to a very good standard and requires attention. And then if we go over the page, uh, we can see uh, the recommendations, oh, sorry, 129, before we get to that, uh, 129. Facilities for storage and processing of blood and blood products are either insufficient or inadequate. That's one of the conclusions. And the second one, the most appropriate response from the Scottish BTS would be an entirely new purpose-built facility for the processing and quality control of blood at this centre. And then we can see the recommendations. Preparation area for bottle preparation must be brought up to standard without delay. Period of 12 months should be sufficient for detailed proposals to be made by the service and SHHD uh, to rectify the deficiencies in the processing facilities and store storage areas. Absence of such proposals will result in drastic reduction of processing activity at the centre, including the cessation, cessation of freeze drying and other deficiencies and comments may be rectified on an ongoing basis. Um, so we can see the real difficulties identified there by in that inspection. Do, do you have can, can, do you have any idea as to why matters had got seemingly so bad by 1982? I think it remained as a hospital of uh, aging, that the age of the hospital or or the service, the, the facility was uh, established during the Second World War. And it remained like this for quite some time. And uh, I, I don't have any, any explanation for that. But I have a feeling that this, I could, I could feel that uh, things were, I mean, there were five centers in Scotland. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure, I haven't seen anything like this in, from other centers, but I, I suspect that there, there was a lot of requirements that needed to be done. And uh, I was personally very sad to see that the, 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 the facility has not been improved when I was working. And in fact, I was very sad on the day when we had to stop using the facility for the production of products. Um, and um, I, I, I remember I wrote something called the obituary of the, the, the facilities for, 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 for uh, product production. I felt sad, but I can't, I can't explain. And remember also, <clears throat> that the new service for the west of Scotland has only been done after I have, after 1992, after when they built a new center in, in Glasgow. So I have no answer. Is that, <clears throat> is that acceptable for me to say? I really have no answer, but that was the situation. And we were, and the staff were all aware of that. And they, and 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 we were, we were actually pleased to see the inspectors' comments in order to make something about it. But I, I'm not sure. I, I think that's all what I can say. And just to clarify one uh, point that you made there, you said you were very sad when you had to stop making the products. Were you, re you were referring there, were you, to the closure of the freeze-drying plant at the hospital, which meant you could no longer make freeze-dry cryoprecipitate? Yes, yes. yes. And I, I'm going to come on and ask you some detailed questions about, about the, that. I must tell you also that, that not, there, there were no other centres that had facilities for, for this. The facilities have been removed from ordinary transfusion services and some put into a fractionation facility or something of that kind. And we remained only to do the, the we continued only to, to do the, the simple, not products, the simple component, that is to say platelets, red cells, plasma, 
uh, individual units of cryoprecipitate for use it to be used um, not mainly for hemo not only for hemophilia but mainly for um, I'm sorry, I can't remember, but it's used to stop the, the, ble the bleeding. Um, I, I forget the name. I did mention that I am running short of words, and I, I trust you will bear with me about this. Absolutely. In, in, few, in few seconds, the word will come about, about the product. Yes. So, uh, and you've also described that while the inspectors in 1982 were saying that really what needs to happen is a new center needs to be built, you described that that didn't happen during the time that you were in in Glasgow, uh, and you left in 1989. Yeah, I think so. I can't remember when it was built. By the way, it's fibrinogen, the word I was looking for. So this is one of the components, not of the products. The products were coming from uh, fractionation centers. Um, if we look now at um, another document a little bit later on, SBTS uh, four zeros four zero six underscore zero one one. This is another inspection of the centre. Now, it's not dated. This document is not dated. The inquiry has dated it in March 1988, I understand, from um, other material. But if we turn over to page two... We can see at the top there, Glasgow and West of Scotland uh, Blood Transfusion Set Service. And if we read the first paragraph... It says that the Glasgow and West of Scotland BTS serves a population of approximately 3 million and has its regional headquarters and laboratories at Law Hospital in Carluke. The regional donor centre is at St Vincent Street in Glasgow. Carluke building was arrest, er, erected in 1956. Approximately 150,000 donations are collected annually and around 140 staff are employed at the centre, which was last inspected in July 1986. Since then, a new sterile suite has been commissioned and brought into use. Um, uh, and so, um, and then we see um, the senior staff list. So this is just going to give us a snapshot of, of the centre in 1988. We can see their director, Dr. Mitchell, four consultants at that stage, including yourself, one senior registrar, principal MLSO, and then three senior chief MLSO is responsible for different um, uh, areas of the uh, transfusion centre's work. Um, then if we go over the page to page three, we can see uh, a list of uh, medical products. Um, and there's a whole range there from whole blood through to concentrated red cells, platelets, uh, fresh frozen plasma, um, etc., et and cryoprecipitate. Dr. Gabra, in your statement, you suggested that cryoprecipitate was used, as far as you can recall, certainly um, uh, um, as part of um, home treatment for people with haemophilia. Is that right? It's only it's only very early that it was used for home treatment, but then. The home treatment was mainly used for uh, by uh, was mainly uh, conducted using concentrates. Uh, however, it was it was it was. Uh, I remember there were fridges that were given to people at home, and they were they had their uh, stocks of uh, cry precipitate, and they used to teach mothers how to give it to, to the children. Uh, but that was, that was the very early phase of home treatment, and then it became, uh, it became clear that it, uh, the plasma-derived plasma -derived products by fractionation 
were the, the, the best way to, to, to use for, for these patients. And then if we go over to page six, I think we can find the answer to the question I asked you earlier and you weren't sure what the answer was. So if we look in the bottom paragraph there, it's under, this is the section of donor grouping, and we can see about halfway, about seven lines down, it's halfway along that line, it says, as the donor records are held at the donor centre in Glasgow, the comparison of new results with previous history does not take place in such cases until the K forms reach St Vincent Street, often some days later. Um, yes, that was quite a d difficult. I think it was sorted out. <coughs> Having the donor place away from this, the centre was a, a, a problem, I think. But and then I, it, oh, sorry. But it was, it was, it, it was the, the situation with many other places, I think, who have just recovered from setting up the old setup that, uh, that came after the, the uh, after the, the using the facilities that were left uh, after the Second World War. I may not be correct in what I'm saying, but uh, I'm trying to find a way to to explain why these things were happening only in Glasgow. I, I I can't I can't say that they were only happening in Glasgow. And then, if we turn over to page eight, please. Yes. Um, we can see four paragraphs down, starting the procedure for dealing with equivocals and positives. This is under the section entitled Virology. Um, it says uh, it's the same for both um, hepatitis B and HIV. Initial screen positives are not issued. Virology staff remove all packs the same evening and sign and countersign the plasma processing worksheet. Um, um, and then it goes on a little bit further down. If any of these tests positive or borderline, the sem samples are referred to the Hepatitis Reference Laboratory at R Rouge Hill Hospital. Is that, can you recall whether that is the laboratory uh, run by uh, Eddie Follett and Brian <coughs> Dapp? I remember that we used to send these things to uh, Rock Hill Hospital to, for, com for, com for confirmation. Um, can I can I just read it again? Yes. The original serum sample is then retested along with a plasma sample obtained from donor grouping and a sample from the original pack pigtail. If any of these tested positive or borderline, the samples are referred to the hepatitis reference laboratory at Rakhil Hospital. If all are negative, then the donor is flagged and three negative donations are required in six months period before a donation will be used. Yes, I remember that this was happening, yes. Is that your question? Yes, yes. So the, the, was that the, 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 your, re, your local reference laboratory then? Was it Russell yes. Hospital? Yes. And, and do you recall whether that was, it, it, was that the laboratory in which um, Dr. Follett and Dr. Dow worked? Doctors. Dr. Eddie Follett and Brian Dow. Yes, I remember these two names. Yes. Yes. I think I think I think I think you're right. I think you're right. Then if we go then please over to page um uh, ten. at the bottom paragraph under future planned and changes and de stroke developments, talks about delivery vans and then the donor center in St. Vincent Street, Glasgow is being refurbished with a view to expanding the activities carried out there to include, for example, the emergency pooling of platelets. Um, and then they say that they will visit the center in due course and then uh, lastly, if we can go over to page 13. Oh, 
we can see a rather different uh, conclusion to the, to the one we looked at from 1982. So we have here conclusions, the facilities for open processing are of high standard and are well maintained. Um, then urgent steps should be taken in, in, re in relation to the way that manual data, um, in relation to manual data handling um, and so on. Um, but is it right to understand from this that while the centre hadn't been rebuilt by 1988, improvements had been made to the laboratory services and the problems that have been identified from 1982 have been uh, sorted out to some extent anyway? Yes, but it has taken quite some time, but it has been sorted out, I think. Um, but yes. Yes, that's what it says, and I, I remember that this was happening and people were, um, the staff were feeling more comfortable and happier with uh, the, the developments that allowed them to do this. Now you tell us, um, Sully, you can take that document down. Um, Sully, uh, uh, Dr. Gabriel, you tell us in your witness statement that uh, the Glasgow Centre collected approximately half the number of donations that were collected in the whole of Scotland. That's correct, yes. Uh, and that was based, w w why was that? Because the population of that, the, that, of, of, that you yeah. served was so, so large? It was a larger area, large, harder, more, more hospitals, and uh, <clears throat> we, have act, we had access to communities and uh, the units of collection used to go there. So it is. It, it depends on the number of the population that you serve. And did you have any role in setting or negotiating the targets for the centre, or was that for Dr. Mitchell or others? I, I, I think that the targets were were discussed, but uh, I, I, I wasn't. I wouldn't say that I was instrumental in. in, in it was a consensus about the needs, and then this, this information is brought to the national directors, and then the national directors were to, uh, to give the okay for changes that are required. Dr. Dr. Brian McClelland, when he was giving evidence, told the inquiry that his recollection was that the Glasgow Centre sometimes fell short of delivering on its plasma targets. Is that something that you can recall? I can't, uh, I can't remember that. I, 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 it is surprising, I, I'm not sure that this, is, this has happened. But, in, but, but I, I, I also am not aware that there were targets except that when you, when, they, when you have collected this, you're expecting to send to, for fractionation that, that, other, that amount based on the number of collections that you have done. But I'm not, I, 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 certainly, I certainly would not, was not aware that this is happening. Um, can you recall whether um, there was sufficient um, PFC factor products returned to Glasgow uh, to meet the needs of the population there that required them. So in other words, was Glasgow self-sufficient uh, in your recollection uh, uh, for factor products during the time that you were there? <clears throat> Yes, I, I think I think that there were there was enough uh, to allow. Uh, depending on, there was enough uh, of products available based on the plasma that was sent outside. That is to say, I'm not sure that uh, there were shortages of of products provided from Edinburgh, from the uh, that were not expected, I think. How did I explain what I'm trying to say? Shall I say it again? Yes. 
Yeah, well, should, should I, should, let me ask a, a question in a slightly different way, and maybe, and, um, uh, and maybe that, that, that might be helpful. Um, we, we can go to them if, if necessary, but there's um, evidence to suggest that certainly in the early 1980s, the Glasgow Haemophilia Centre was using quite a lot of commercial products. Now, that may have been a choice, or it may have been because there wasn't enough PFC, NHS product for them to use. Do, can you recall, do, are you able to help us at all with, 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 which, with which is accurate? Did you have any conversations with Haemophilia Centre directors about, about what, the, what their prescribing practice was, whether they preferred commercial products or PFC products, or were they asking for more PFC products and you weren't able to provide them? I, I remember that that period there was shortage all over, all over, whether in Glasgow or in Edinburgh or even in England. And I think that was the, the time when people were having to rely on imported products because of the changes in that has happened in the clinical approach to treatment of the patients. Whether that was caused by the insufficiency of producing the plasma that is to be used, or it is simply because that is the fact of what is happening. The use, the clinical use has outstriping, outstri 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 outstripping, yes, the, 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 the available products. And, and, and is it right to understand your evidence that there came a time when, when there, were then, that there, that there were then sufficient products, the PFC products, I should say? There was enough products coming out of PFC uh, according to the amount of plasma that was coming in. And self-sufficiency in Scotland became aware, we became aware of self-sufficiency, insufficient, self-insufficiency when the changes happened in the clinical use of these products. We, we've... The inquiry has seen evidence, again, from other centres of um, uh, the transfusion centre being involved in um, providing the PFC product to the haemophilia centres. And in some cases, the haemophilia centre director saying to somebody at the transfusion centre, I need more than you've given me. The transfusion centre going off and sort of trying to borrow bits of of, of, of PFC product from other centres and trying to find more PFC product. Can you recall whether that was a role that the was undertaken at Glasgow, trying to sort of make sure that the, the haemophilia centre directors had enough product and trying to find more if more was needed? Yes, I think I think they were trying to find more products to use, uh, and that's why. That's not simply the, the problem that was happening in Glasgow, but it was happening in other parts as well. That's my impression, that, that it was, it was a, a situation of inability to have available products for the patient. And do, do you, um, did you have any role in um, discussing with your clinical colleagues, their prescribing practices. So, for example, discussing with them whether or not it would be better to be prescribing commercial products or NHS products. Was that part of the role, uh, your role in the transfusion centre? I, I don't think that uh, my clinicians, my, our colleagues, the clinicians, were to, Im to, to import material, to use imported material, uh, if they had products prepared in Scotland. And when the, 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 the fractionation centre was established in Scotland, they, 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 were, they were able to use local products. But, uh, but when, when you have patients, you have to find what is available and use it. Now, we, um, the inquiry had evidence from Dr. Gillen, uh, and he, um, he, his impression was that the Glasgow Centre was, uh, using his words, a bit reluctant to accept new ideas. He said there was always a feeling that Glasgow wanted to do it their own way. 
is that is that a characterization of the Glasgow Centre as 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 a matter of generality that you recognise and uh, and understand? No, but I, I I thought that there are facilities in 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 in, in, in Glasgow that were <clears throat> that were up to the to the job, and we we had to have the resources uh, uh, to 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 continue our work. I mean these these two documents that you showed were were not uh, were not I mean, they, they cannot be accepted by 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 people working and wanting their work to become better. I'm going to ask you some questions now about donor sessions and, and how those are, were arranged. Um, I think you've already told us that, that some took place in the St Vincent Street site in Glasgow. D did any take place in the headquarters at Law? No. We um, only had in, at Law only those who came for uh, plasmapheresis. So there was, there was some limited manual plasmapheresis at law, was there? Yes, yes. Um, and so the, is it right to say then that, that, that Glasgow uh, mainly got their donations from mobile sessions in the community or on blood buses? Yes. And how important were um, sessions organised at places of work for Glasgow? Was that a, was that a, a, a big stream of donations? A big. Was was, was that did, did that did that account for, for quite a lot of the sessions? Sessions um, organised yeah, either, either in uh, factories or in uh, university places or, or in community places, churches, church uh, places, etc. Um, and so, in terms of plasmapheresis, manual plasmapheresis at the, in the headquarters in law, and then um, uh, if we can just look at a, um, a study that was carried out in Glasgow in 1983 uh, of plasmapheresis, we might be able to get some information about that. So it's um, PRSE uh, 303741. Uh, we can see here the date at the bottom, 15th of April, 1980. Sorry, I don't want to go to that. Um, I beg your pardon. It's SBTS. I don't think we need to go to this. This is the, this is the um, the protocol for the for the study we're about to look at. So I don't think we need to we don't need to look at that. So SBTS four zeros two three eight underscore one zero four. Yes, this is the one I wanted to look at. So we've got there a report, um, a report to the Scottish directors on uh, plasma by automated plasma yes. phrases, April 1984. And then we've got a picture of Scotland and we can see that I'm assuming that the bit shaded in black represents the, the, the area covered by Glasgow, the Glasgow Centre. Is that right? Yes, yes. And it's the higher high population. Um, so we can see if we go over to page two, it's a, it's a, a study by Dr. Mitchell and by uh, Margaret Morgan. And then it says, following discussions and earlier proposals in 1983, two studies were commissioned by the Scottish National Blood Transfusion Directors into the production of source plasma for factor eight. The first to compare machine and manual plasmapheresis collection systems and the second to look at the option of the optimal additive solution. It was agreed the first product would be conducted in the west of Scotland and the second in the southeast. This report outlines the progress which has been made in the west of Scotland over the past year from February 1983 until February 1984. Uh, and so then if we go over to page three, we can see the questions to be answered by the study at the bottom half of that page. Motivation of donors for manual and machine plasmapheresis. How practical are both options and how do they compare? Evaluation of the safety and donor response to the machine and manual plasmapheresis. Evaluation and comparison of the cost and suitability of both systems to produce plasma. 
then over the page, evaluation and comparison of the quality of FFP obtained by the two methods and evaluation and direct comparison of two batches of fractionated material collected by both methods from the same donor population handled and processed identically and finished um, and finished intermediate purity factor eight concentrate. Um, if we look down, uh, down at the results at paragraph two, we can see the donor response to the machine was uniformly favorable and, and enthusiastic. Indeed, as the study progressed, most of the donors were hinting that they would be bitterly disappointed if they were not able to continue with use of the machine in the future. And then if we go over to pa uh, page five, please, we can see the conclusion, which is this study demonstrated that with drive and enthusiasm on the part of staff, it's possible to continue to motivate blood donors to remain enthusiastic in their willingness to supply source plasma by both manual and machine methods. The quality of the plasma was equally good and the cost of production are very comparable in terms of staffing and donor safety. Um, so is it right to understand that prior to this study, which is dated April 1984, plasmapheresis in Glasgow was limited to that manual plasmapheresis in at law. Subsequent to the study, um, automated manual um, sorry, automate, automated phoresis came on um, came came on stream in the uh, centre in, in in Glasgow and St Vincent Street. Yes, yes. Uh, I think at that stage as well, uh, there were a number of uh, um, plasmapheresis centers, not manual, but uh, mechanical plasmapheresis centers uh, being introduced in many parts of the country as well, uh, in, in England in particular. I'm not sure whether they have already started it in Edinburgh or not, but uh, yes, that there was a need at that stage to increase the plasma collection. And we were starting to feel that we are short, not, not in Glasgow, but we are in Scotland, short of source plasma or recovered plasma, source plasma from machines and uh, recovered plasma from blood banks. It became clear that we need uh, to increase the plasma collection uh, the, for uh, the source plasma. And was um, plasmapheresis used to collect, if I can put it this way, ordinary plasma as opposed to high, high titrate plasma? Yes, it, 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 it used, it, 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 I mean, I remember that I used to go to, to have some donors with high titer NTD to start on the plasma machines as well. So it, 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 it became, it, it became important and we were actually, blood collection was geared towards plasma rather than red cells. We were becoming aware that what the need now is not the red cells and it's not the, pla the platelets. It has become the plasma because we needed it for, uh, for, for many products, particularly factor eight at that stage and also other things, immunoglobulin and that sort of thing. Now, we looked earlier at the Medicines Inspectorate report from 1988, which had a list of products, and, and that included platelets that had been recovered by phoresis, but no plasma that had been recovered by phoresis. Do you think by 1988 there was no plasma by phoresis? Or do you think that, that that's perhaps the, the it's, it's just not noted in that report? Well, the, the, the last report that we read, that was when we were just thinking, not we in Glasgow, but Scotland was just thinking of introducing machines all over Scotland. We were under the impression that we, are, we were self-sufficient at that stage until we became aware that it, was, it has overstripped the, the, the available resources. So you think that by 1988, in fact, that was just when when um, automated phoresis was being brought in in to the in Glasgow. I, I, I really I can't remember exact dates, but this there must be records for that. But certainly the 
that was this trial and this study that was done uh, when with uh, Margaret Morgan and uh, Ruffin was the, the start of introducing, was it in 88? I think it was in eight, uh, that report of the study. It was in 88? That, that report of the study was in 1984. 84. Yes. And that was the, the date when we started to think of introducing plasma. Can you recall what um, what was done to try and attract new donors to, to, to Glasgow, to, to donating blood? Well, the, 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 there, there was... There were leaflets, there were... Um, um, I used to go and give talks to in 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 in, in places, in schools and and uh, uh, factories, and uh, the usual promotional systems were used and improved as time went on. Did you use advertising on the radio or um, that sort of thing? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, all these things. I'm sorry that I'm not able to remember the details, but... Uh, it's a long time ago. Yes, but they, they, were, they were things that were happening uh, and we were improving them all the time. Um, just, I'm going to ask you some questions now about the donor sessions as a matter of generality and we'll come on to look at some of the material that was provided um, once the AIDS crisis hit um, a little bit later on but um, just as a matter of generality is it right to understand that in Glasgow um, rather than providing donors with a written health questionnaire as we've seen used in other centres but actually, it was it, a donor interview was used. So each donor was asked a number of questions about how they were feeling and when they last donated, and those kinds of issues by a donor attendant. Can you can you recall whether that was the practice? Yes, but it was. I, I remember that that was written, written for the for the donor attendant to read with the with the with the donor. So the donor attendant had a script to read out to the donor. Yes to ask questions, and then the donor attendant would presumably tick or write in what the answers were. I, I, I seem to remember that that was the case, yes. Uh, and you, in your statement, have, 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 have stressed the importance of the clarity of the donor interview. Um, can you tell us a, a bit about what, what you meant by, what you mean by, by that? So that that paper that was written and used by the by the uh, by the by the nurse or the the donor carer um, or the doctor actually uh, had to be clear so that the, the the donor is able to answer correctly what is expected what we are trying to find out in order to either ask him to continue to give blood or. For instance, if he says that I have, I have a running uh, nose and throat and I'm not well, he, they, we will tell him to postpone it until he, that sort of thing. I mean, that's what I meant by clarity. But when the situation came and we were dealing with hepatitis and, uh, and, and HIV, it needed to be clearer than, than, than what it used to be. And I think at that stage, we had to revise our uh, approach to donor selection. And were you able to achieve any privacy for donors when those interviews were taking place? No, I thought that they were. It was done in, in private. But I, if I mentioned something like this, I was in, I was thinking that. This is one of the important issues that one has to take care of, that this kind of discussion should be conducted in private. Uh, and uh, yes, I, it was conducted in private. I, but privacy is an important, 
important item in making sure that the donor is not thinking of something else that other people are hearing. I think it was a general comment that I was saying. So your recollection is that in sessions, for example, that took place in church halls or in community locations... There were facilities and there were screens, I think. Yes, yes. The presence of the screen was an important thing. Um, so I, I'm about to start on, on a different topic, and I, I note the time. I wonder if now would be an appropriate time to take a break. It's a uh, yes, well, we'll take a break until quarter to 12. Uh, quarter to 12, please, Dr. Gabra. Yes.